Um, so today there will be two lectures. Uh, first, let me know if you have any questions about home assignments or the previous lecture material. Well, it, it would be good uh, to get uh, some uh, clarifications about uh, what exactly uh, we need uh, to do, but uh, I think uh, I'll be better wait uh, uh, until the end uh, the lectures. Uh, okay. I've uh, got a question about uh, home assignment. I wrote them in Discord, so it's about the utility maximization, whether it is different for the Bayesian approach uh, than for the plugin approach. Uh, it's not supposed to be different. Let's see. Uh, so there is something wrong. This is not the correct answer. Um, obviously, the utility maximization is different. Uh, well, utility is the same, but you need to be maximizing the uh, taking expectation over the prior of uh, parameter. And so your prior is mu and sigma. Uh, so this is not the right answer. Okay. Uh, now, um, let me comment on uh, something that I realized that um, I'm not sure how many of you uh, understand numerical integration, but uh, since it's uh, you need to do it in the home assignment, and uh, I didn't explain, let me explain it. So, uh, it's actually very simple. Suppose you need to integrate. Um, calculate the integral, say, um, um, minus one, one x squared dx. Um, of course, you know how to compute it uh, analytically, but suppose we want to calculate it numerically. So if you look at the picture of the x squared function, Um, one way to do the integration is uh, to think about the integration is the, so what is the, first of all, what is the integral of this uh, function from minus one to one? This is the area below this line. Now, how can we approximate, co compute this numerically? Um, uh, what we need to do is just break this interval from minus one to one into sub intervals. So introduce grid points and then calculate uh, the size of the grid point. Um, Let's call it uh, delta 
uh, multiplied by the value of each point in on the grid. Uh, so it will be x1, x2, and so on, xn. And so what we do, we just calculate a sum of x eta. We, uh, we calculate the sum of x eta squared multiplied by delta. Um, from i to n, where n is the number of grid points, uh, as simple as it is. So the idea here is that x e square, x i squared, sorry, multiplied by delta is the size of this, uh, not the size, the, the um, area of this rectangle at point x i uh, with the one length being delta and the other lengths, the shorter lengths being delta and the uh, uh, longer lengths being uh, uh, xi squared. And so basically what we are doing here, we are approximating this function, this area by some of these rectangles. So this should be intuitive. And in fact, this is how the theory of integrals in, is introduced. Well, this is one way of introducing the theory of integrals, which is Riemann integrals. Uh, this is different from, there are other theories of introducing integrals, like uh, the Berg integrals, uh, which are equivalent to Riemann integrals when you calculate them for measurable sets. But, um, uh, the most simple way that probably you learned in calculus uh, is introducing Riemann integrals as the approximation of the area as delta goes to zero. So, and then when you do the integration, numerical integration, uh, you literally do just that. Now, uh, um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, do we, um, so, um, as we know, we can approximate uh, the integral by lower double sum and by, like, I don't know how it is in English, higher double sum. So, in this case, we use lower. So, we basically tend to a little bit underestimate the integral, right? But we could do the same, just, like, with... Uh, yeah, there are, th that's not, I mean, I'm just giving uh, one example. That's not the only example. Uh, that's not the only way to calculate the integral. Uh, this is, uh, I don't remember the name of this rule, but this is, of course, the simplest, the dumbest. Uh, you can do, uh, so, like, let me, actually just now look at any function. So suppose we are, this is our some function. So uh, what you're talking about is the following. We can calculate this integral as like e for each piece take uh, this area so I'm just say, zooming in into this area. Uh, we can take either this area or this area. It's fine. It shouldn't, doesn't matter much. And uh, okay. um, that's not the point. There are many other ways calculating integrals. Perhaps uh, the more, a bit more advanced way is to, uh, to be doing the, trapezoid rule, something like that. So we do uh, a thing like linear approximation like that from point to point. Uh, 
uh, we can be calculating the midpoint like this of each grid point and they have perhaps taking the midpoint not perhaps as far as I remember it has a better property it was a million years ago when I studied it uh, but in practice if you want to do something simple this is the way to go um, all other approaches they don't really give you much uh, like extraordinary uh, extraordinary improvement and precision. They do improve the precision, but uh, that's not not something drastic. And uh, for uh, one dimensional integrals, uh, you don't uh, you usually don't even do many things. You just uh, I mean you don't work with uh, different schemes of numerical integration you just take one like the one that I said uh, there are ways of doing what's more important actually uh, there are ways of calculating integrals in a smart way which I'm not going to explain and we are not going to use uh this is like whole own area of numerical uh optimization and uh you like when i was studying computer science we had like a semester long class on numerical methods and there was like a couple of months of numerical integration uh it's it's whole area and then in economics we use it a lot because we need to do numerical integration a lot, especially we need to do it fast and we need to do it on multi-dimensional objects, especially in Bayesian econ economics, uh, Bayesian econometrics, whatever, in Bayesian methods, we need to do lots of integration, lots of numerical integration. And uh, there are all kinds of methods, like one method, rather than having grid points, you choose just a few points oh sorry this is not a good so rather than choosing uh, a grid of points uh, you can choose say um, just three points um, or like just four points like um, say three points is easy but uh, four, five points is more is more revealing so you choose this and then perhaps this uh no it's not like let me change the color like at a different distance like minus x plus x and then you calculate your function in this smartly chosen points and there is a whole theory how you can approximate super well integrals with just say five points instead of constructing a grid of 100 points um it actually was developed by soviet mathematicians and uh, was remaining uh, uh so there was a guy at central mathematical institute uh says I forgot, semi, Central Economical Institute in Moscow, uh, Smolyak. Uh, he's still alive, I think. Um, he developed like this super smart way of choosing just a few points that give you super approximate uh, value of the integral. But anyway, and then there's a the whole theory behind it, how you choose the Smolyak points, stuff like that. And then there are quadrature methods and like there, there is whole area of numerical integration. And I don't want to get into this. This is where you gain a lot and not this like lower upper approximation. Uh, but again, I don't want to get into that. Now, 
the next thing is that another way to for doing uh, numerical integration is uh, doing Monte Carlo integration. Uh, and with Monte Carlo integration, what you do is almost the same as with the grid. But instead of having an equidistant grid, you choose points randomly. And then uh, calculate the value of the function of the in the random points. This doesn't make much sense in the um, one-dimensional case. But once you go into multiple dimensions, you have a huge curse of dimensionality. Uh, and uh, doing Monte Carlo integration now starts making sense. Now, imagine you want to, to demonstrate perhaps uh, Usefulness of Monte Carlo integration, it still makes sense to consider one dimensional case. But now imagine that you want to calculate the integral um, uh, like this. Uh, so the mean of the normal distribution, not the mean, sorry. Yeah, well, yeah, suppose the mean. So plus infinity, minus infinity. So that uh, where this is a probability density function of normal with some mean mu and sigma squared. So this is a dumb example, but suppose you want to calculate this uh, uh, numerically, this thing. So one way of doing it is uh, uh, similar to supposed to be x squared. Uh, one way of doing it is similar to what I've described uh, in the previous uh, picture here. Uh, you just say take like I don't know minus one one hundred plus one hundred interval break it into, I don't know, 10,000 points and calculate the value uh, in 10,000 points of this. That would be your integral. That's one way of doing it. Now, but we can do it using the idea of Monte Carlo simulations. We can draw points from the normal distribution uh, randomly and uh, then add them up. So instead of doing this equidistant grid, what we can do, we can take choose like i equal to say 10,000 or 1,000 and then uh, draw Xi's from uh, normal mu sigma squared, and then uh, add them up. And that would be approximately your integral. Um, ah, and yeah, you need to divide by i. Why this is the integral? I can explain it, but I'm afraid that 
even if I explain, you either will forget or you will not uh, get it. So usually um, the best way to understand it is just, I don't know, maybe think about it and ask questions. Uh, but yeah, let me say it anyway, why this scheme would uh, give you the integral like that. Because basically the fact that you're drawing xi from a normal distribution means that you would be, so this is your probability density function of the normal distribution. It means that you will be getting uh, more points from here where the probability of drawing is high and fewer points uh, farther away from the average, from the mean. And then if you draw, make a draw of 1000 points, you would get a few points here, here, uh, here, here, and many points here. Which means that uh, then when you added, add up all the points with the same weight, one over i, you will add uh, more points, like you would put more weight of points from here and less weight of points from here. And this automatically takes into account this probability. Um, I don't know if that, this makes sense, but basically this is what is happening here with numerical integration. And this is what you are doing in this part two of assignment one. Um, now, you can do this with the grid approach as well, with the same idea uh, or similar idea. You can uh, say, uh, well, no, let me not get into that too much, too much, oh, sorry, too much uh, time, I think, and I will uh, provide you with too many details and you would uh, maybe get confused. So let me stop here. Basically, this is a way of doing numerical integration over probability density functions. Uh, and that's what you need to do in the home assignment. But I basically what I tell you to do now. Uh, the one question that you need to be aware of that that you should be able to understand is how do you choose if I should be 1000 or 10,000 or 100,000 or like where do you stop? How many points should be drawn? So there are practical considerations and there are numerical considerations. Obviously, the fewer points you draw, the less precise is your calculation. But then if you have a very uh, costly computations for each point, then uh, you take fewer draws. If the computations are not so costly, then you take more computation, uh, more draws. Where do you stop? The usual rule of thumb is either to repeat the draws several times, like say five times, uh, independently, like 1,000 draws, uh, do your calculations. 1,000 new draws, do your calculations. And if the results do not differ much, you're good. You stop there. If results differ a lot, you increase um, the number of draws. Uh, another way of uh, doing the same, the same thing is keep increasing the number of draws until uh, results stop changing. So like you calculate your integral with 10,000 draws or do your calculations with 10,000 draws, you calculate the integral. Then you do with 100,000 draws, you calculate and you compare the one with 10,000 draws and the one with 100,000 draws. If uh, the difference is not large, you stop. If the difference is large, 
you do 1 million draws. Then you compare the integral with mo or percolations one with 1 million draws and with uh, 100,000 draws, compare and so on. Now, uh, there is a rule of thumb uh, actually uh, in computational, there is a theory, kind of a theorem. Uh, it's not a general result, but it's a rule of thumb is that usually uh, in order to increase precision of your integral in one digit, you need to increase the number of draws uh, by 100. So suppose you, you calculate your integral with 1000 draws and you are not satisfied with your precision uh, and you want to go one digit more precise like uh, say your integral is supposed to theoretically it's one, 0 0.1, but your integral gave something like 0 0.3. So not precise, very not precise. Then uh, the rule of thumb is that uh, in order to get more precise integral, you need to increase the number of draws, not 10 times, not tenfold, but 100 fold. Uh, Okay, so I hope this is like a little crash course on numerical integration makes sense. And this is a part of what you're doing in the assignment. And it shouldn't be that difficult. You just do the draws and calculate the sum uh, in the context that I gave you. But overall, it's uh, not a trivial area of uh, numerical computations. Does this make sense? Yes, it does. So we basically uh, have uh, uh, an expected value on the right side uh, of the uh, equation. And uh, we have uh, uh, a sample mean uh, on the left side of the equation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, you can apply this logic to any function like suppose a more generally you need to calculate something like uh, uh, like take any distribution say let f be a, a cumulative density a cumulative distribution function with uh, support um, a b then uh, suppose we want to integrate we want to calculate the integral a b g x d f x uh, then uh, the way to do it, uh, the way to approximate the, where g is some, any function, then the way to do it is uh, using the approach that I've just described, is to make i draws to let uh, i draws from fx and then calculate this um so this is a general approach that's what you're doing in the home assignment um all right so hopefully this makes sense um okay now, let me talk about, oh, sorry. Ah, yeah, I need to say it. What am I saying? Okay. Uh, let's go, it's frozen apparently, what happened?
Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Now let me say a couple of words uh, where we are and where we are where we are going. Um, so what we did right now. We talked about let me decrease a bit. We talked about uh, loss functions and uh, the importance of loss functions for the forecasts. Mostly when we do practical applications, we work with quadratic loss, but you should be aware that of the fact that it's not the only loss, and I spend lots of time explaining um, that uh, the loss functions uh, should be, depending on your context, a problem on what you want to achieve with the forecast, loss functions might be different. And um, I gave you, hopefully, I gave you lo lots of examples explaining uh, uh, why you might be willing to choose a different loss functions, loss function. And uh, here I want to give one more example. Uh, there is, it's a fact from the data that for many professional forecasters of financial data, but not only financial data, uh, all kinds of data, uh, forecasts tend to be, say, negatively biased, uh, like for financial data. And uh, usually it's explained, uh, oh, they are just biased, maybe positively, maybe not negatively. And uh, if you interpret the, the decision problem that the forecasters are making as optimization of a quadratic loss, then this doesn't make sense. Because what you observe in the real data that under quadratic loss, uh, you would do better if you do uh, like a different forecast. Uh, and so it's strange to see that forecasts are biased in the producing large square error. But the one interpretation of it is that uh, for forecasters optimizing different loss functions, and there are justifications why would you why you would want to uh, uh, minimize different loss functions. Then in the next what I called lecture two, we devoted like three lectures to it. I walk you through just the basic uh, problem of uh, forecasting problems. What we want to achieve, uh, what uh, we want to minimize the risk, what are the approaches, approaches are either classical approach or Bayesian approach, on the classical approach, uh, there are two methods. Uh, one is plug-in approach, the other is uh, uh, sample analog approach. And then we talked about uh, what it means to have an optimal forecast and how it never can be achieved in the real world. And uh, when we get a forecast, what we are really getting uh, that we don't, we, never forecast uh, the outcome. We forecast some feature of the conditional distribution, uh, which you should keep in mind. And I spent a lot of time explaining this. Now I skipped some important, now I'm skipping some important parts. So we are not done here. In order to understand forecasting problem even deeper, uh, I'm skipping something that uh, the textbook, something very important that the textbook talks in chapters four. Uh, I'm skipping that because um, 
there is no time. We have only four lectures left, and I want to devote them to something more applied, uh, a bit more applied. Uh, so go from the super high level now to more particular problems and methods. Uh, but there are still some very important and conceptual issues to talk, to consider. And uh, if you ever want to go deep into forecasting, either you do cross-sectional machine learning or you do time series forecasting, you definitely need to learn way more material. Uh, but okay, so for now it's okay. And I stop here and what we're going to do from here is we will talk about uh, univariate linear prediction models, which is today, which will be uh, ARIMA, uh, how it arises, what we do with it. Then uh, we will talk about uh, uh, subset sele model selection methods or subset selection methods, which would be uh, la lasso ridge uh elastic net sorry i'm super sloppy here uh elastic net then we will talk about uh trees random forests um why there are many uh, machine learning techniques, but these are considered to be one of the most fundamental machine learning techniques. Uh, and uh, they are the most widely used by the beginners and more experienced people. Uh, and here I should add boosting trees. And then, so hopefully we will go through this stuff today. Uh, we'll see how we'll do. Then next week we will talk about this stuff. And we'll finish it with VERs, which is also super vector autoregressions, which are extremely important in the context of uh, time series forecasting or economic forecasting. And that would be it. And then, uh, and in the uh, tutorials, we will go through all of the examples. So it's like we have also four tutorials left. So we will go through ARIMA, LASSO, Forests, VRs. And then your assi assignment will cover ARIMA, LASSO, Rich, Elastic Net, Trees, and VRs. OK, so that's where we are. That's what That's the plan. We have uh, two lectures left and two tutorials left. Uh, now, so here in today's lecture, we're going to talk about ARIMA. Uh, that is based on chapter seven of the book, my discussion today. And then the tutorials will be based on other material. Um, so, uh, this uh, autoregressive moving average models, that's what stands for ARMA. So we start with ARMA and then we will add uh, letter I uh, a, a bit towards the end. So it started with uh, maybe 1970s was a big development. I don't know when people started uh, came up with the idea, but definitely there was this two guys, Box and Jenkins, and they have a, a textbook which is uh, still super popular, and uh, they explain like everything you ever know, wanted to know about ARIMA models, and they are considered to be like this is considered to be the Bible of ARMA uh, ARIMA. So uh, ARMA models are super. Or oh, ARIMA are super uh, popular. Uh, let me first explain why they're super popular, and then we will talk about what they are. So, uh, in forecasting and prediction, this is the workhorse. Why? First, 
very minimal demand on the data. Uh, the only demand on the data is just the time series itself. Like if you think about our tutorials example uh, that we were working with was the GDP forecasting. Um, to apply ARMA or ARIMA, everything we need to do is just to know is just GDP itself, nothing else. Uh, and our information set is say we're in quarter uh, right now, what quarter four uh, of 2022, we want to predict uh, GDP of Russia in say quarter, say in this quarter, by the end of this quarter, what we're going to use, we are going to use GDP of Russia in all the previous quarters and nothing else. So usually this is considered to be a benchmark. You first, before you do anything else uh, with a time series, you apply ARMA. That's first thing you need to do. And that you choose the best ARMA model uh, you could do, and you use it as a benchmark. Uh, and then you're trying to beat this benchmark with more advanced methods. Uh, now, why it makes sense? There is something called world representation theorem, and we are going to discuss it today, uh, which provides a theoretical justification why knowing only the time series and nothing else is enough in theory to forecast. And then uh, the last thing is that it serves as a benchmark, and it's surprisingly difficult to beat it in the real in empirical work. Uh, so, okay, now let us uh, talk about the first thing, the theoretical justification, the world representation theorem. Uh, so in order to talk about the world representation theorem, we need to talk about uh, covariance to shonarity. Uh That's the, I would say, um, fundamental concept to apply this theory. So consider a time series of stochastic process of infinite length, lengths and infinite lengths is important here. And uh, suppose that, imagine that it's observed at discrete points in time t. Uh, then uh, suppose that the mean of yt is a deterministic process. So at each time t, we can calculate the, the expectation of yt. And then we will come up with a, a series of mu t's. Uh, then suppose this is a deterministic process, which means that it's perfectly predictable infinitely far into the future. This can be a constant term, so just mu, uh, doesn't depend on time, or it can be a linear time trend, some constant a multiplied by a t, or like a sinusoid, but with a non-periodicity. Uh, then say a, a special case of this, is, as I said, can be just a con constant term, which can always be taken equal to zero by subtracting it from all y's. Then for any integer j, define alta covariance of length j. This is the definition. Just the expectation of yt multiplied by yt minus j. Uh, let's call this alta covariance uh, gamma jt. Then assume that this doesn't depend on t, but only on the distance j. So if we have, say, uh, if we are thinking about auto covariance of order y, uh, then uh, we can take out the covariance of this and say this, or this and this y's, and they are the same. Suppose that this holds, or if we, uh, this would be out the covariance of order one. 
then if for uh, any t and any j uh, this is true then the process uh, is said are said to be covariant stationary uh, also called white sand stationary or second order stationary uh, second order because we are considering uh, covariance uh, then uh, the next the next case of definition that we need to formulate the world representation theorem is a white noise we say that a stochastic process epsilon t is called white noise if it has zero mean, zero mean, uh, constant unconditional variance, and serially uncorrelated. We denote it uh, epsilon t is white noise, so zero sigma squared. Then the Walt representation theorem says that any covariant stationary stochastic process yt can be represented as a linear combination of serially uncorrelated white noise terms um, and linearly deterministic component uh, mu t. Uh, moreover, here the coefficients in this representation, coefficients theta j, are independent of time. So there is no t component here, and uh, their um, squares are finite. The sum of their squares is finite. So look at it, absorb it. Very straightforward. In a way, it's an amazing result, but um, any straightforward. Uh, if you have a covariant stationary process, you can just write it down as a as a linear combination of the history of shocks going back into the infinite uh, past plus uh, a linearly deterministic component mu t. Uh, and more important, um, not more importantly, and importantly, the coefficients uh, do not change with time, and uh, um, they all add up to a finite number, square, their squares. And here, what it means that the coefficients do not change with time, that means that if you consider y, like next period, y t plus one, then you will have the same coefficients, uh, y j, epsilon t plus one minus j plus mu t plus one. So this, uh, this will be the same coefficients if you go forward one period, then forward two periods and so on. Uh, several implications of the world representation theorem. Ah, yes, and I have here the sketch of a proof. It's uh, not complete, uh, but at least it gives you an idea how such thing is proved and uh, uh, the most important part of proving this theorem is how we construct this uh, white noise we construct it by subtracting uh, y from yt its projection on its infinite past and this is important so uh, Imagine that we know the infinite past, then we literally could run uh, uh, ordinary least squares regression of yt on its infinite past, calculate the residual, and that would be our epsilon t. And if the process is covariant stationary, then one can show that the variance, uh, sorry, the epsilon t will be a white noise. Um, okay, now uh, several observations. Observation number one, 
from uh, the definition of the white noise, it follows that uh, we cannot predict uh, epsilon t uh, if we use the any model of the past data. Uh, so epsilon t is something um, unpredictable. Uh, end of story. Then the second observation is uh, the coefficients theta i, which are called moving average coefficients, uh, time invariant, and this is important for estimating forecasting models. Uh, we can, one way of uh, just jumping ahead the gun, uh, one way of estimating uh, models is instead of uh, going it to infinity, taking it to infinity, approximate it with some finite order Q um, and say, okay, this is an approximation. And uh, if our model is correct, then we can use our finite data sample uh, to estimate coefficients theta. If coefficients theta change with time, then there is no hope in estimating such models. And so the fact that this theorem guarantees us that these coefficients, uh, they don't depend on time, is the justification for doing this kind of estimation. Uh, finally, the results that the sum of squared coefficients is finite tells us that the sum of squared moving average parameters converges. And this is the reason why we can do the approximation here. That means that uh, they, because this is an infinite sum, at some point uh, we can, we can uh, choose a point Sorry, uh, like this. We can divide this sum into two parts and we can choose Q here uh, so that this is becomes super tiny. And that's what allows us, that's the theoretical justification for doing this approximation with a, a finite Q. And again, this follows from the fact that the whole sum is finite. Uh, if there is no possibility of choosing such Q, then uh, the sum will be unbounded. Because no matter, like just logically, no matter at what point we stop, there is a non-trivial part left. Uh, if we can do it uh, infinitely many times, then we will get an unbounded sum. Uh, what if, what if uh, uh, that sum converges? Yeah, then at some point we can stop and uh, say, OK, that's 0, right? So uh, th that's what it means for the process uh, to be unitrude. Or, or uh, yes, I, I, just just yeah. like I keep, keep hearing about uh, a unit root and I uh, still don't get uh, exactly uh, what it means. We'll talk and uh, we'll talk about the unit root today, but uh, one. Uh, one way of thinking about the unit root is the one for which uh, no matter where we cut this uh, sum of thetas, there is a non-trivial part remaining that doesn't converge to zero. A in fact, for the unit root, uh, all coefficients theta are ones. So a unit root is a process where all theta j's are one. Uh, all right. 
but we will talk about it uh, today. Uh, okay, so I actually we talk about it now. Yes, so as simple as it is. So the random walk or unit root process is just this is the definition. And by iterating it forward, you can write it like so. And so uh, here, ep uh, epsilon t is the white noise. Uh, in terms of the world representation, theta j is uh, all, one, uh, all ones. The expectation of yt is y0. Uh, but variance is uh, t sigma squared, which depends on time, which doesn't satisfy the condition for the world representation theorem. And so this gives you an idea that this process, the random walk or unit or unit root process, it does have a world representation, but uh that world representation doesn't satisfy this uh sorry not this doesn't satisfy this condition so not all processes that have world representation uh satisfy this condition all right does this make sense yes no ho hopefully yes uh okay now let us talk about outer regressive moving average and outer regressive moving average models so uh i think okay i skip this because i kind of said it in words uh, let us uh, define autoregressive and moving average models. Uh, I should have said I sh this slide should go logically later. I don't know why I put it here. So, uh, autoregressive model, this is the definition autoregressive model of order P. Uh, is uh, a model or the regressive process or the regressive model. So we can call it also process uh, is uh, where a value of uh, y at time t is depends on uh, p previous values plus a white noise. Now compare it with the moving average models, which is defined here. Here, yt depends on the white noise plus the q previous white noises, the sum of q previous white noises. And then the arma pq is just when we put R, ar and ma together. So p logs and uh, q previous shocks or, and uh, the current shock. Um, okay, so uh, we can write ARMA in power series notation like so. So this is, I just, uh, rewrote it again in this slide, uh, ARMA model. Uh, we can write it, we can bring all Y's to the left-hand side or, and then leave all epsilons on the right-hand side and write it in this way, phi L Y T is equal to theta L epsilon T, where phi L and theta L are so-called log polynomials. They are defined here. And uh, L here is the log operator, such that if L to the power of J 
up, is applied to yt, then we get yt minus j for positive j. Uh, why this notation is useful? Uh, we will use this notation in the coming slides. And this is, sorry, the usual notation that uh, appears um, in many contexts and textbooks. So you should be familiar with this notation. Uh, okay, so let me give examples. Up, up until now, I just defined uh, AR process and MA process and ARMA and uh, perhaps if we want to connect with the world representation theorem, then this is obviously a ready world representation of yt because we can, another way to write it is to write like this is equal to theta one and t minus one plus plus theta q epsilon t minus q plus zero multiplied epsilon t minus q minus one plus zero epsilon t minus q minus two and so on. And so all thetas are zeros after period q. Uh, going, going more than to the period q. Uh, and obviously this this is already in the world representation way, uh, form. Uh, while this is not exactly in the world representation and this is not exactly in the world representation. And we are going to see right now that actually we can convert this into a world representation and let's see how it's done. So basically, the best way to just let's let's consider the simplest example: AR one process. So your ARMA zero one. Then we have just one log. Uh, so in log polynomial notation, this is can be written like this, and so theta L is equal to one. Then uh, going from here to here, we can substitute yt minus one uh, and then substitute yt minus two uh, and keep substituting. And eventually, uh, sorry, there is a mistake here. yt, there is no this term. Yeah, um, but ah, yeah, sorry. It's supposed to be y t minus epsilon, epsilon t minus one. Um, and so by then doing this backward substitution, we can uh, write it like this. where the coefficients of this leg polynomial theta L are phi one taken to the power of I. Now, if uh, we keep iterating and say we calculate the uh, variance of this term, it will give us this. Uh, the which which is uh, uh, smaller than this where gamma y zero is this. 
um, well, I guess it's even equivalent. Uh, I need to make sure. And then uh, this converges to zero, provided that this term converges to zero as h goes to infinity. And of course, a uh, condition for this is that uh, phi one is less than one. And so we get that uh, for R1 process, uh, we can construct an equivalent uh, moving average, the world representation, provided that uh, uh, phi one goes to zero, which is uh, the sufficient condition for this is uh, that uh, phi one in absolute value is less than one. And so being phi one is less than one is the stationarity condition for this process. Uh, now let us consider MA1 model and we can we can con by doing a backward substitution substitution again we can write it like so by substituting uh, by bringing uh, this to the left hand side and then uh, using the definition of epsilon t uh, substituting it back and back and back, we will get this. And then again, this can give us AR H process uh, with coefficients phi s equal to minus theta one to the power of s. Uh, And then this can be represented as an infinite order AR process, provided that this guy goes to zero as h goes to infinity. And the sufficient condition for this is that uh, theta one in absolute value is less than one. Uh, this condition is called invertibility. Uh, so this is this condition is stationarity and this condition is invertibility. Uh, why it's invertibility? Because this implies that going back to uh, leg operator representation, this implies that we can write this as uh, theta L, sorry, theta minus one L, phi L, y t is equal to epsilon t. So we can, if this operator is invertible, we can write it like this, so it will be AR process. Um, so this the stationarity condition for for air one process that absolute value of phi one is less than one can be thought uh, of in terms of roots of the this polynomial. The root of this polynomial is. Uh, phi one minus one. And so uh, having phi one less than one in absolute value means that the root is more than one. This is a necessary and sufficient condition for stationarity of a one process. That's why this condition is called, uh, this condition is called the stationarity condition. More generally, stationarity of uh, air process of order P uh, requires that all roots of the corresponding polynomial uh, fall outside of the unit sector or uh, circle. Sorry. So we consider for
for the uh, ARP process, the corresponding polynomial is this. And if uh, all roots of this polynomial uh, fall outside the unit sector, then we say that uh, we know that this is a stationary process. And then uh, similar for the invertibility condition of theta z. And uh, arma pq process that is stationary and invertible can be written either as an AR model or as an MA model, typically of an infinite order. So we can write it as like this or like this. Um, it uh, takes, uh, sorry, not takes, it, uh, you, it's useful to look at the outer correlations of different orders or different ARMA models. Uh, why this is a useful exercise? Because uh, when you are doing a practical choice of a particular ARMA model, what it means in practice to choose an ARMA models, uh, an ARMA model, it means to choose the p and q coefficients and estimate the corresponding uh, phi and theta coefficients, so, sorry, p and q orders, and then estimate the corresponding uh, phi and theta coefficients. Now, how do you estimating phi, phi and theta coefficients uh, once you fix the order is easy. Uh, relatively easy. But choosing the order is difficult. How do you choose P and Q? It's a huge deal. There is, uh, there are lots of uh, um, uh, lots of uh, recommendations, methodologies how you can be choosing the order, giving a particular process. The whole book of Box and Jenkins, there is this thing, methodology of Box and Jenkins, where they prescribed, uh, it was a large part of Box and Jenkins book, original book was devoted to uh, choices of P and Q. And then one way of choosing P and Q is by looking at your time series process, uh, looking at the alta correlation of different orders. And then you keep in mind that this is how alter correlations look for R1, this is how they look for MA1, this is how they look for more general ARMA, this is how they look for R2, so you keep this in mind, and then you, you look at the autocorrelations of your process, and then you decide what it looks more like. Does it look more like this, or like this, or maybe like this? Uh, and this is literally one way of deciding order. No, in some way, there is no statistics involved here. You literally look, just eyeball the outer correlations and decide. And we are going, there are some other graphs you do, but basically that's uh, it. And we will do it in, during the tutorial. So I will show you more concrete examples and how, how we can choose it. That's why knowing how it looks uh, is important. And I'm going to explain now uh, what we observe from these figures. During our uh, time series course, um, well, uh, they showed us uh, those PAC and other, um, how to say, uh, methods to find those parameters, but uh, at the end, uh, they just said that it's, uh, well, 
nowadays it's just easier to like um to like uh build like 40 armors uh with uh, different combinations of uh p and q and just choose the most uh fitting one for example by bic and like that's the more optimal approach than uh, like eyeballing or just uh, trying to do some PIC statistics. Yeah, the uh, indeed the problem with this is uh, um, you uh, I mean that that's what people do. But the problem with this is uh, it's based on uh, some statistics like, I don't know, information criteria, say, uh, Bayesian or Akaike or Khan Akin, I always mispronounce, uh, or whatever, BAC. The problem with that is that uh, they are all approximate criteria and they have, uh, they can be misleading and you can, you can just check it by yourself, use some ARMA model to generate time series and see how often you would get that ARMA model based on a kayak information criteria. Um, that's one critique of this automatic selection, even though that's what people do. Uh, another critique of this uh, automatic selection can perhaps can be that it might be uh, uh, unable to distinguish between different models. Different models might have very close information criteria values, uh, say, if we are choosing information criteria then uh, uh, you need somehow, somehow that means that uh, your information criteria do not have much power to distinguish between uh, different specifications. And uh, just eyeballing your process might help you to choose the right one. Although usually, if uh, again, I should say that usually, if information criteria I uh, cannot distinguish between different models, you you should go with the most parsimonious, the shortest model. That's the rule of thumb. Um, but overall, I should say that again, even though you don't uh, you rely on um, some information criteria or whatever criteria or even you might be relying on uh, uh, across validation methods uh, well in time series you uh, out of sample prediction you choose the one that does the best out of sample prediction uh, even though you can do that, still kind of having a good basic understanding of how different uh, types of models look like helps uh, to make a more informative choice. And uh, obviously you should be using like everything you can Okay. I have a question about uh, how adequate uh, ad adequate uh, ARMA models uh, if uh, we think about a model as a uh, representation of uh, a true process, for example, take for, take for example, uh, an average uh, temperature uh, uh, at a certain date. Uh, uh, does uh, is this process uh, uh, AR uh, or MA? Probably yes, because uh, if it was uh, 
called uh, yesterday is probably uh, called uh, today. But uh, if you think about uh, how uh, weather actually work, work actually works, uh, there are some uh, complicated uh, processes in the atmosphere. So it, it's, it's not like, uh, it's not really uh, AR, MA. It's something much more complicated and uh, the, auto, the, the autocorrelation uh, is uh, just, uh, uh, well, uh, it exists, but uh, it uh, does not uh, explain what's going on. And uh, if we take uh, uh, an economic example, GDP, for example, uh, is uh, that th does uh, uh, GDP in this year uh, depends uh, depend on uh, uh, G G the GDP in previous years. Uh, kind of, yes, but uh, if you think about how GDP is formed, really, uh, it, might, it might not be uh, a straightforward uh, function of uh, GDP in previous years. So uh, how uh, justified uh, uh, the usage of AR MA uh, models if we uh, want uh, not just uh, forecast, but uh, I don't know, do, do some uh, 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 achieve some uh, deeper understanding. Uh, Uh, yeah, so uh, this is uh, a question now, uh, I would say goes into the heart of what I was trying to explain in the when I was talking about these conceptual issues with forecasting when I was uh, trying to deliver this point. Um, so your world representation well Leah, let me write it like this is And uh, presumably, this is your white, not presumably, this is your white noise. And in terms of the weather forecast, uh, if you know the history of weather, going back to the uh, Big Bang, uh, the creation of the time, then even if you know all of that, that's all you can all you can construct and this part you don't know uh it would realize only this month but you need to do a forecast for this month and so this is where logically or theoretically this is where this part of not knowing what this month is going to be we know that uh, it would be, it would look like the history in terms of this component. But there will be a shock, which is not predictable using this representation. Uh, now, why I said that that goes into the heart of um, what I was trying to talk about in the previous lectures, because uh, I was trying to emphasize this point again and again that with forecasting, we most of the time, with most of the processes, or even with all of the processes, or sorry, all of the process, all of the forecasting setups, we forecast some feature of the distribution of Ys. 
we never forecast Y itself. So going back to the forecast of the weather, suppose we limit ourselves to the historical data of the weather. Uh, given under quadratic laws, the best we can do is to forecast the uh, mean of the weather, mean of the temperature. Or, no, sorry, not, that's not the best we can do. The, actually, the best we can do is forecast the distribution. We can forecast all the quantiles. So we can forecast the distribution, but we never forecast a particular value tomorrow. We can then take the mean or the median and say, OK, uh, our best forecast under quadratic laws is the mean under the mean absolute uh, loss. Sorry, uh, under absolute loss is the median. But that's all we can do. And the outcome will be always something different. And this is what I was trying to emphasize again and again. Uh, now, is this the best we can do? Obviously not, because uh, just thinking about the temperature example, uh, we can uh, go into the subject area, build models of the temperature, of the atmosphere and stuff, use all kinds of variables, and try to predict more given our models more complicated models. Uh, this is where this like machine learning, that's where it's, that's the direction where it's going. It's trying to attract more data, more sophisticated models to be able to predict better. better. But at the end of the day, it is still theoretically predicting some feature of the distribution. It's just the distribution is more precise, perhaps. Uh, and the one more thing I want to say is um, why we still study AR processes, ARMA processes. This is, again, because um, in many contexts, it's just a benchmark that is hard to, to beat. We can come up with more sophisticated models, but sometimes this benchmark is hard to beat. Does this make sense? Yeah. Uh, I also uh, have a practical question. <clears throat> uh, what if, for example, we have uh, uh, quarterly observations, but uh, uh, our, pro our real process is such that uh, uh, Y uh, depends on the value of y, uh, for example, five months months ago. So uh, the uh, uh, the period of the process is not uh, perfectly aligned with uh, our observations. Uh, what we will we see uh, then uh, uh, in data in uh, these uh, diagrams, for example? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I don't know. Uh, you uh, maybe uh, that's that sounds like a homework assignment or like a practical exercise that you can do. Obvi I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure you can simulate and see how it looks. I've never done so. Very interesting to look. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, we can do it. I mean, you can do it. Uh, uh, yourself at uh, the tutorials. I don't think there is some certain theory about that. Uh, because uh, when you go to time series forecasting, a practical time series forecasting, people face all kinds of practical issues. Like what if you have some time series that's uh, on the monthly basis, other are on the quarterly, how do you combine all of them? So in the tutorials, we just average the monthly ones to quarterly and then we're combining them but that's not the best way to do it there are other ways to do it then what if you have uh, uh, observations appearing at different dates 
how do you deal with that? Suppose one observation come uh, at the mid of the month, the other uh, at the end of the month, and the third one at the beginning of the month, how do you combine such observations? Uh, there are all kinds of practical issues, and that's your forecasting uh, literature, and that's when you go into practice, you are thinking about these issues. Hmm. Okay. So let me see. I want to finish it and then we will make a break. So uh, what we observe here, you ask many questions. Just want to wanna say that so usually for an MA1 process, the decay will be very large of after autocorrelations of like different orders of y's. The autocorrelation for order one would be high. So this is the var variance. Then autocorrelation of order one would be high and then drops to zero. For R1, uh, the higher is the uh, phi, which is called the persistent parameter, the smaller is the decay. The, sorry, the slower is the decay. For autocorrelation parameter, it's very slow. For, for high autocorrelation parameter, it's slow. For low autocorrelation parameter, it's very fast. Um, and then, uh, so for ARMA, it looks uh, something in between. But th there are better pictures to judge. And we'll talk about them during the tutorials. So let me skip this. Uh, I think so I talked about this. Skip this. So let me stop here. We have, we'll make a break. Um, is this, this is, we can talk about it during tutorials. And especially you, since you had time series, we can skip, but I needed to talk about this stuff. Yeah, okay. So let, let us uh, just stop here. You can uh, check this stuff on your own, but some of this stuff will just go through it using practical examples in tutorials. So let us now make a 20 minute break till uh, 11.30 and then we'll uh, talk about uh, shrinkage methods, loss of reach and stuff. Okay.